Welcome back to the Wolverine.com podcast. I'm John Borton. We're here with uh, one of our absolute favorites, uh, Mr. Brian Bush, who is the play-by-play man for Michigan basketball. We're going to be talking a lot of Michigan basketball on this particular podcast. Uh, but welcome back to the podcast, Brian. I want to talk some football first. Let's do it, John. Always glad to be here. Well, obviously, uh, Michigan with a uh, sort of a momentous ending to this season – beat Ohio State, and then they take care of business in that uh, Big Ten championship game. Your impressions of uh, what this team did in switching from that that super high of beating Ohio State to just all business and, and really handling Iowa and, and taking them in a way so that it was, it was pretty deflating for the Hawkeyes, I thought, uh, with what the defense was doing and holding them in. Yeah, I mean, it was funny. I, I had joked with a few people uh, in the week between the Ohio State game and the Big Ten Championship game that, you know, there aren't many times where you, you have to legitimately ask the question, uh, is this a trap game when you're playing for a, a league championship? But because of the year-long build to the Ohio State game, the beat Ohio drills, the what are you doing to beat Ohio State signs around the facility, uh, there was at least that potential for it. But this team – it was a coronation. This team was not going to be denied. That felt like the final Big Ten hurdle was Ohio State, and, and Iowa just happened to run into a buzzsaw. And, and listen, it could have been a different game and a different pace to it and a different uh, nervousness to it had things gone differently in the first 10 minutes, had Iowa taken advantage of that three and out, had made that field goal, had not given up two big plays, because Michigan's offense was not thriving outside of those two. But that's what winning teams do. That's what good ball clubs find a way to execute is, is a couple of big plays, start to pull away. And then what makes this team so tough is that they can just grind you away, taking clock away, taking the ball down the field, scoring touchdowns. It's demoralizing. Uh, so, so what Michigan did, it was the, the, the really the coronation. Ohio State was the prove-it moment. They got the job done. And then Iowa was a 60-minute celebration of what Michigan had done and, and, and the complete 180 from a year ago. And it was an also uh, underscoring what Michigan can do when a relatively tough defense can slow down what they do normally, that grinding, the running game and all. Uh, your One of your broadcast partners, Doug Karsh, is on with us regularly, and he pointed out the fact that, that Michigan has now become the, the – uh, most explosive team in the nation. If you gauge that by how many 50 yard plus plays that they, they make, I think uh, Donovan Edwards opened everybody's eyes early. We knew he could catch. We knew he could run. Now we know he can uh, throw with his gloves on and someone bearing down on him. Yeah. You know, there was that story about how uh, JJ and Donovan and a few other guys went and uh, ran routes after the Nebraska game at four 30 in the morning. Do we, I, I think now we're unsure as to who threw those passes. Was it JJ? Was it Donovan? Uh, no, in all seriousness, I mean, that's the creativity of this offense. And that's what happens when you do have an offense that is so ingrained in a certain identity, but has the willingness and the ability to try to mix things up. I mean, you know, Josh Gaddis talked about it uh, with Doug on our pregame show that they were setting up that, that flea flicker against Ohio state literally all season. And for them to then come up with the unique plays that we saw like that Donovan Edwards deal uh, against Iowa, it shows you that, you know, you can say, well, exhaust every option. Well, maybe you do. And then you create new fun options on the back end. I, I know that question came out a lot about that, that Maryland kickoff return and people said, well, why didn't you say that for Ohio state? Well, it's all about tendencies. It's all about what you see on film and what you can exploit. Uh, and, and Michigan will try to do the same against a Georgia team that until the SEC championship game had not been exploited in any way, shape or form with its defense. So uh, we'll see what they can glean from that and, and create here over the next few weeks. Right. And and one thing set up the other. You, you put the ball in uh, Edwards hands through the air and you've got everybody worried about that. And all of a sudden, then you can run the uh, the end around to uh, someone else when you think that uh, Edwards is going to get it. You can throw, you can have Edwards throw. I mean, it, it, I think I understood Maryland better, much better after Ohio State and, uh, and Iowa. So 
in in this game, just your thoughts on um, how these this group of guys finished it off and were able to to really truly celebrate uh, a breakthrough moment because first Big Ten championship under Jim Harbaugh, first Big Ten championship in seventeen years, and that that still uh, is unbelievable to me. But but this group earned it and finished it off and uh, and got to really celebrate. Yeah, I mean, all the, you know, all the video, all the moments that we saw really down the stretch in the fourth quarter, once Michigan went up 28 to three, that was, I think, when it felt real to a lot of the players. And once it got to 35, three was, I think, when it felt real to everybody else on the sideline, including Coach Harbaugh. And, and, you know, to see all of that, and to know that, I mean, if you would have, if you and I would have talked about a Big Ten championship three months ago, three months ago today was the eve of the the Michigan Washington game, where you're thinking, okay, this is this is a litmus test just to see if this team could be, you know, a real bowl eligible, um, you know, not not even contender, but just they're going to get to a bowl game, uh, and to see where they've gone now and how they've gotten there. It, with wins in hostile environments, with a win over Ohio State, just beating down a team in Iowa that, that doesn't get taken to the woodshed like Michigan did. It's, you know, if you beat Iowa, you come out with some scars on your side of things too in most cases. So uh, just all those emotions coming out, especially for the guys who, who stuck around for the extra year, uh, the guys who you know really poured everything into it, the Aiden Hutchinsons, the Andrew Vistardises of the world. Uh, I mean, it, it, it's really, really cool. The Brad Hawkins of the world, um, you know, they they had opportunities to move on, uh, whether it was in football or otherwise, uh, and they wanted one more crack at this. When, when literally, like, I think the whole like no one believes in us theory is is pretty overused in sports. But who thought that this was possible? The first unranked team to go to the college football playoff. I mean, it truly is a landmark achievement, uh, and to see all those emotions come out in real time, and and then you know. Uh, it was it was surreal to me seeing you know Coach Harbaugh on the playoff reveal committee joking with Reese Davis. I mean that was that was so cool. Like who would have thunk in three months ago that that would happen? It, it just shows you how special this group is. Yeah, no doubt. Uh, before we switch gears into basketball, let's talk about Michigan, Georgia, Georgia, the toast of the college football world almost all season. Certainly with their defense, they are going to be very very tough. They are five stars all over the place. And yet Alabama makes them look pretty human on that side of the football. Your thoughts about this matchup for the Wolverines? Yeah, I mean, I think points are going to be at a premium. Uh, it's going to be really tough for both sides. Um, and, and, and where I really look at is I, I like the quarterback matchup for Michigan. You know, that, that's not something that we've heard much this season. Cade McNamara has been, has been doubted. He's been discounted at times this season. And the dude just goes out and makes plays and is willing to, to let others get involved and be the stars of the show. Um, I think we saw with Stetson Bennett a, a real question about, hey, against the elite of the elite defenses, can he really go down and lead multiple touchdown drives? Now, Georgia still, like you said, they've got five stars all over the place. They're really, really good. Um, you know you look at the line, I think it's kind of, hey, we don't really know what to do. Georgia has more talent on paper, so we're just going to make it a touchdown. Um, but but the edge rushing, the, the the ability to get pressure with four is an equalizer. It can, it can negate any sort of real or perceived talent discrepancies. Uh, and, and Michigan's got, you know, two guys who can really make things tough. So uh, this is one of those games where I, I really think the, the team that makes the fewest mistakes has a much better chance to win. But it, it's it, it's the reason it's the primetime game on New Year's Eve. Two big-time brands, two huge programs. Uh, man, I, I can't wait. And, and I know that, you know, we're, we're going to – we got three weeks to break this thing down. But but on paper right now, that's where I look at. Can Cade McNamara uh, be that, that efficient uh, leader – on the offensive side and can Michigan make things difficult on that Georgia offensive line. So uh, if that can happen, Michigan's they've got enough. There's no doubt they have the ability to get the job done, uh, but it's a matter of making sure that you execute in that moment. And, and, and the layoff, I think adds a unique layer and wrinkle to that. 
the bill, the ability, and the license, as Jim Harbaugh would uh, would say. Uh, all right, let's let's talk some basketball now. And this has been a little little bit of a whipsaw. We we saw Michigan go from okay, they're they're going to win the the Big Ten championship, picked as that, and then all of a sudden the Michigan fan base plummeting into despair with what they saw with Seton Hall in Arizona. Now we've seen seen a little mitigation of of those emotions in the fact that okay, Michigan pulled it together against San Diego State, had a very strong opener on the road at Nebraska. We know Nebraska's not an elite Big Ten team at this point. Where are your thoughts with uh, with this group right now? Yeah, it's interesting. I think. You know, this team's offense is not as good as it was against Nebraska on Tuesday night. This team is not as bad as it was uh, at times in, in, you know, the the Arizona game or in the North Carolina game. This is a ball club that needs to hit some shots. And over the last couple of games, they've hit some shots because it opens up just everything else. And in particular, Hunter Dickinson on the inside. Uh, if, if you are hitting, listen, 50% is not sustainable. That's where Michigan is at for the last two games. But if you're hitting 40% of your threes, which is where about Michigan was last year, you can't always double Hunter Dickinson. You have to mix things up. And Hunter's good enough to take in that information, digest it quickly, and be able to to make a play. Uh, But when you're double and triple teaming him, and then you can't make the shots on the outside like we saw in a few instances, you're in some trouble. So uh, there is a, a feeling of, you know, I think there's a really a good understanding of what the path is for Michigan to beat really good teams, to win Big Ten games against not just the Nebraskas, but but the Purdue's, the the Michigan States, the other you know other teams that you figure are going to be in that conversation to to compete for a Big Ten title. Um, what I've said all year is that this team was not going to be a completely set it and forget it type of a roster uh, in in the middle of December. Um, they, they need more time. It's, it's a younger group than we saw last year. Last year, this team had an understanding of kind of what it wanted to be. And then the Hunter Dickinson, you know, emergence right out of the gates was, was kind of not found money, but it was, you know, it was, it was a positive development. You don't normally see a freshman just come in guns a blazing and, and establish himself the way that he did. But, but the roster, the pieces around him fit so that it was, uh, it was a real possibility and he took advantage of it. So, you know, there are probably going to be some games this year, um, even, you know, in the next month or two where you go, boy, what Michigan can't hit anything. They're in some trouble. And there are going to be some games where, where everything's clicking and they can beat any team in the country. Uh, and, and it's just a different style than what we've seen each of the last two years. Um, and that I think is probably more of where this roster and this program is going based on the way that coach Howard's recruiting. Speaking of true freshmen, not being an instant success. Uh, talk about how, Caleb Houston is starting to looking like he's rounding into shape, getting more confident, shooting the ball. And your thoughts on Musa Diabate so far? Yeah, I mean, I think you're you're seeing the flashes from them. It's it's really tough to be uber consistent as a freshman. And we, we I don't think there was ever any expectation that Musa was going to be just a consistent, you know, instant plug and play type of numbers and go from there because of just how, how he plays the game, how frenetic he is, but just how talented he is. And and you saw in the first half against uh, North Carolina in the game against UNLV, you see what happens at, at the, you know, at the upper bound of what he can bring. Uh, and, and for Caleb, you know, I think there was more of an expectation fair or not because of just how he played in, you know, in the uh, you know, for team Canada over the summer, um, and just his pedigree and, and what he was bringing, and also the need for Michigan. Michigan needed to find a guy to play that three spot. Everything else kind of fit puzzle wise, at least on paper coming into the season. So it, it hasn't been uh, completely flawless, but you're, you're seeing here of late just how good this young man can be. And, and you know, I've been just as impressed on the defensive side of things. Listen, the shots are going to fall. He's got too good of a, of a jump shot. He's got too good of a stroke to, to not consistently make threes. But I've been impressed with the defensive side, and, and that's going to be really important coming into league play in this you know quick little two-game stint and then heading into uh, the, the real chunk of it come early January. 
What do you think is going to happen with the point guard spot going forward? We've seen uh, some uneven results at times and uh, and a, a true freshman there getting maybe a little longer run than I expected in Frankie Collins. Yeah, Frankie's played well. He's taken advantage of, of a lot of his opportunities. You know, I, I think this has the potential to be a, a way for Michigan to really mix up how they approach things. It, it does feel like two kind of different styles with Devontae on the floor versus Frankie Collins. And I, I don't necessarily think that if both are clicking well, that one is better than the other. Uh, you know, I think Frankie has exceeded expectations so far. Devontae hasn't quite lived up to them yet. But you see over the last couple of games, those those numbers go up there for Devontae. You know, rebounds, assists. It's amazing what can happen when you have, uh, you know, when you avoid foul trouble and you don't turn the ball over. You do those two things and you got a real chance to be successful at the point guard position. He was never going to be, you know, a 20-plus a point a night guy like he had the potential of being at Coastal Carolina. He knew that. The team knew that. Uh, I just never thought he got a chance to really get into a rhythm in, in the season's first five, six games because of the foul trouble, because of the turnovers. Uh, and then a couple of games got away from Michigan a little earlier than they were expecting. So uh, I, I don't know if it'll be an even split. But I do think there'll be more of a timeshare there than I think what was expected at the beginning. And that I don't think is so much about, hey, well, Devontae's not living up to it. I, I think it's just Frankie is is ready, he's willing, uh, and he's been productive. And he gives Michigan a different layer. They can they can be malleable with their styles. Um, but you know, I, I don't think I don't think the answer should be, okay, well, just give the give the reins to Frankie and let him go. Because Devontae is still going to be a valuable piece to this team. I, I just don't know if it's going to be in that 30 plus minute a night side of things that we saw from Mike Smith last year. And, and that's okay. I mean, Mike, Mike was more of the outlier from a, an up transfer as a grad transfer. Uh, right. That that's not normally how it goes. Um, this is no, you know, this is more of the, of the, the commonality of the norm where it's going to take some time to get acclimated. Uh, but, but if and when it fully clicks uh, and if Frankie continues to develop, then you've got two really good point guards and well, as we know in the Big Ten, sometimes you don't have any good point guards. Right. Quick word on uh, what you think is coming about in this Minnesota game on Saturday night. Yeah, I mean, Minnesota is similar to Tarleton State in that they basically have like a seven man rotation. Uh, so who you see is kind of who you'll get. Uh, I mean, coming into the season, I-, I heard a lot of people say that Minnesota was just going to be awful and that this was the, the, the bottom of the barrel in the Big Ten. And, and listen, they lost, in essence, all but one scholarship player. Eric Curry is the only scholarship player from last year who's playing this year. They have another guy, Isaiah Enan, who came back, but he's out for the year with a knee injury. Uh, you know, they're, they're trying to find themselves under a new head coach without their best player from last year in Marcus Carr, um, and, and they're 7-1. and one. And listen, you can, you can knock the schedule, and, and it's not – amazing but they won at Pitt they won at Mississippi State uh they've taken care of their bye games uh this is this is not the gimme game that I think people were expecting it to be when the schedule came out and and that's a credit to to Ben Johnson a guy who knows the area he's from Minneapolis uh he's you know he, he was an assistant coach at many or at Minnesota he played the tail end of his career at Minnesota um, so this is this is a homecoming for him. It, it's going to be a longer rebuild. I'm, I'm not saying this team is going to go and, and make the tournament. I don't think that's the case. Uh, but this is far from a, an immediate out. Um, and, and they do a good job of holding on to the basketball. They're not going to make a whole lot in the way of mistakes. Uh, this is one of those games. You know, it's funny. I, I, I heard it from uh, from Dan Dierdorf a lot in football. Iowa's not going to give Michigan the Big Ten title. Michigan needs to take it. I kind of feel that way about this matchup in basketball as well. Michigan's the better team on paper. They've got more talent. Uh, but if you let them linger and you give them opportunities that they haven't earned, uh, they're going to hang around in this thing. So, and, and case in point, you know, look like Michigan State was going to just roll them, and, and Minnesota made it interesting down the stretch in the second half. Uh, so uh, th- this is a good test for Michigan, um, and, and it's going to be good for them to, to kind of get a chance to have a really their first extended stretch at home. Uh, which which isn't normally common for for a program like Michigan to have so many games away from Chrysler to start the season. So uh, it'd be nice to get these three before the trip to Central Florida and and then kind of resume Big Ten play after that. All right. He's Brian Bush, and you will hear him on the the Minnesota broadcast and every broadcast of uh, Michigan basketball, bringing you the play-by-play. Brian, uh, thanks for stopping by. Really appreciate you. We will follow closely the fortunes of both Jawan Howard's and Jim Harbaugh's Wolverines here in the next month.
All right, John, always good to be here.